Shalom Chabrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. This is a prophetic uh, news segment, and it's something that we've actually been bringing out already, but I think it is high time that I address this subject once again for those that are watching here uh, on YouTube on Israeli News Live. Uh, the title of our message here this evening in our news broadcast is Pope Francis Fulfilling Prophecy. Uh, and probably on YouTube it'll be Pope Francis fulfilling biblical prophecy. And I got I got an email uh, today, in fact, by a brother that uh, really heavily condemned me because he said I have falsely accused Pope Francis of standing for gay marriage, um, and that's really not what I'm actually talking about in this particular broadcast. Uh, we've already seen the world in the direction that they have gone there, and the Vatican has been opening up to the gay community as well, um, you know, and so none, nonetheless, that is definitely happening. Uh, it's not something that I get on as much as what other people do. I am looking at more serious biblical prophecies that are being fulfilled in Israel as far as the Sodom and Gomorrah and the church getting themselves in the same condition that Lot is in. It's definitely clear that that is something that the Vatican is, is certainly mired down in the mud as well. But I will say this. I do believe that there are many Catholics that are opposed to this uh, and do not stand for that. But Pope Francis has put himself on a level, uh, skirting around the issue, you might say, of standing for uh, these such things as it is. But that is, again, this is not the, the point that I am looking at myself. What I am looking at um, is, is something much deeper, uh, much deeper than that to start with. Um, so at any rate there, let's take and uh, I want to take you at this point here uh, to, the, um, to the Word of God because this evening the message that we will be dealing with is going to be a, a message directly to my Jewish brothers and sisters in Israel uh, and, and a blessing no doubt to my uh, Christian brothers and sisters as well around the world. And it is a very serious message. It is not one to be taken lightly. It is, it is a very serious message, and it is something that, that needs to be addressed. And um, so we, what we want to do, if you have your Bible with you, uh, I would like for you to take and turn with me. Uh, we're going to start in the book of Micah. Like I said, a, for a lot of you, this is going to be a repeat of information, but stay tuned in the broadcast. I am going to be bringing out scriptures concerning near the end of this to my Jewish brothers, especially those at the Temple Institute, um, uh, to Rabbi Richman, a message directly for him and for those that are the supporters of the Third Temple being built. And uh, I, I will say I am not opposed to the Third Temple itself being built. I am opposed to what the intended purpose of the Temple will be used for. Uh, so I just want to kind of state that to kind of to get us started there. So anyhow, all right, those of you that are watching on live stream, you're going to be able to see this as well. So let's go right to, um, to the screenshot here so you can actually get a look at the, the view here. Let me see if we can't, before we really get kicking off in high gear here, let's see if we can't get a better quality here. Um, one, get your audio quality a little bit better. I see we have a little issue on that. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> let me see if we can't get something adjusted as well for the... Um, all right, that takes care of the audio there. Let me close that down there. And let's look at the... Um, okay. All right, so we are we're in Micah chapter four here. Now, <clears throat> to the friends that I have in Israel, one of the prophecies that we are seeing right before our eyes that is being fulfilled is something that uh, that I think that many of many of you are oblivious to, and. When we go to Micah chapter 4, we're going to be looking here, starting around verse 6, and let me just read this with you. It says, In that day saith the Lord, 
will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven away, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off, a mighty nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. Okay? Even forever there. Be'ad olam, just as it says here in Hebrew. See? And it's right there. Those of you that are looking here on live stream, Zion. Okay? Be'chat Zion. On Mount Zion. Eliachim be'chat Zion. Uh, see, I will be there, I will reign over them in Melzan henceforth even forever. So God has promised to return the children of Israel, the house of Israel here, uh, the, or the Jewish people, back to their homeland and they're going to dwell on Mount Zion. That's what the promise actually states there. And then in verse uh, 7, excuse me, verse 8, uh, he goes on to say here, And thou, Migdal, uh, Eder, the hill of daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come. Yea, the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. And then he asks the question, Now why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished, and that pains have taken the hold of thee as a woman in travail? Okay? Now, I think it's rather fascinating that the prophet is actually speaking the way he's doing here, asking you, you know, is there, is there no king in thee? You know, has, has, your, uh, has your counselor perished, he goes on to say. Now, for my Jewish brethren, you know, one of the simplest things that, that you should be able to recognize in this here is that the king is where Israel goes wrong and, uh, and, and when we're looking at the prophecies there, Israel wanted a king. When Samuel the prophet was, was the prophet over Israel, we wanted a king. We did not want uh, Samuel being the one to lead us as, as the Jewish people. We wanted a king to, to reign over us. And this was not God's plan. And so after, we, of course, we got a good king. We, first we got Saul. He was aroused about. He didn't do the way God intended for him to do. But we finally got some good kings in there. And, excuse me, but, you know, David was a good king. Solomon was a good king. Then Solomon goes off into idolatry. And then later, we finally get Ahab on the throne, who did what? He married Jezebel. He brought idolatry into Israel through his marriage with Jezebel. And that's exactly what God did not want to happen. And so when God is actually addressing this to us as, as a Jewish people, he is asking us a question. One, he's brought us back to our homeland. We're in the homeland. We're, we are a delivered people. And so he asks the question, is there no king in thee? Because we're in travail. All right, let's go back. Let's take a, let's take a look at the verse again. So we clear on what we got here. All right. He says plainly here in uh, verse 9, now, while do I, now, now why, see, dost thou cry out aloud? Atalama, Sirei, well, ah, see, why are you, why, why is this happening to you? Why are you, uh, why are you crying out aloud? Oh, daughter of Zion, that's the daughter of Zion, representing that future generation. He says, like a woman in, excuse me, uh, is there no king in thee? We rejected, the, we rejected Samuel the prophet. We rejected God's way. No wonder, my Jewish brethren, when this man named Jesus, Yeshua of Nazareth, Yeshua shall Nazareth, when he was here on the earth, we could not accept him as being the prophet. But he was. And he was trying to get us to recognize where, our, where we went wrong. Now Ahab had married Jezebel. And because of the marriage that he had did with Jezebel, he brought idolatry into Israel. This is what brought Roman rule into the country. It's pretty much the same thing that's going on today, if you, if you think about it. All right. Then he asks us the question, has your counselor perished? All right. Verse 9. Is thy counselor perished, that pains have taken hold of thee as a woman in travail? 
and it's exactly what's happened. We did, our counselor did perish. According to Isaiah 9, 6, that there would be, a son would be born. He'd be called the counselor, the prince of peace, the mighty God, the everlasting father. There's your counselor. And he's perished. There's no king in thee because we elected prime minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The first time we ran through the streets and our people cried out, Benny, king of the Jews. But it didn't work. And now he's in here his second term, as it was prophesied by Mike Evans, and it still doesn't work. And so God has to ask us the question, why are you crying out to me? Is there no king in thee? Are you worried about this Iranian nuclear deal? Are you worried about all the nations gathered against you? What about your king? Can't your king deliver you? Can't Prime Minister Netanyahu deliver you from all this evil? Well, I understand your, your counselor perished. This is what God is doing. God is bringing us back to where we left him. All right? So, then it goes on to say here in the 10th verse, Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion. You see, God is bringing the, the, the people of Israel to a point of labor to bring forth the son, to bring forth the child. So he says here, For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and shalt dwell in the field, and shalt come even into Babylon. There shalt thou be rescued. There shall the Lord redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. Do you know why that is written there? Do you know that is a prophecy? I say that especially to my Christian friends too. You guys, I wonder if you've seen it, what he's saying here. You see, notice, let's read verse 10, that last part there again. And shall, see, he, goes, he says, you'll go forth out of the city. What city? Jerusalem. You're going to go forth out of the city. What city? Because we know where Mount Zion is. There he brought, brings them to Mount Zion. God says that he's going to dwell with us there even forevermore. He's restored Israel back to their homeland. And now he says, you're going to, be, you're going to go out. Is that right? That's what he says here. All right? And shall dwell in the field, and shall come even unto Babylon. Wow. There shalt thou be rescued. There shall the Lord redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. Do you remember when Yeshua came on the earth, his disciples thought that he would deliver them from the hand of the Romans? But they weren't delivered at that time. So God is resetting the stage. The Romans are once again in control. They're once again in control in Israel. And that may be a hard thing for people to accept. A lot of people may not like that idea. But it's true. The Romans are definitely in control. And the Vatican is gaining more and more control on a daily basis. Um, we can look back and see that Prime Minister Netanyahu gives an official seat to Pope Francis, or excuse me, not Pope Francis, but Pope Benedict, for the Vatican's popes to have an official seat at the tomb of David. And makes you, you know, he gets an official seat, so you cannot help but wonder if the Pope of Rome is given an official seat there, who's in control of Israel? Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Who is actually in control of Israel? What well, we would hope to think that God is in control, and we know that God is in control. But what is interesting is that while all this is going on, the Pope of Rome, the Vatican itself, is once again getting a major stronghold in Israel. Let me just share that with you so you guys can see this as well. Um, right here on the screen, you can see Israeli flags right there mingled with Vatican flags. And it's everywhere. It's everywhere. There's, there's pins made that way, etc. In Israel, 
they, you'll see the Catholic Church's uh, two key flag with the triple crown, Pope's triple crown flying everywhere in Israel. Why do they allow that? If they've not allowed the Vatican to get control as they have, you know, it's a shame to see that in the first place. But it's, it's been allowed. It's been allowed to, to have uh, the Catholic Church has been given a great authority there. So God says here that we're going to be delivered. He says we're going to go even into Babylon. Babylon is Rome, the Roman Empire. But we're going to dwell in the fields. I said to you that Scripture is being fulfilled. Pope Francis is fulfilling biblical prophecy. Now, for those of you that are skeptics, I, I, I have to ask you the question then, why, why then, have you permitted the infrastructure that effectively will turn Jerusalem into an international city? This here, this picture, for those of their own live stream that are watching this, and you'll see it on YouTube as well, this picture here is a checkpoint on Highway 1 coming up into Jerusalem. As you can see here, I'll take those, this would be only for those that are on live stream there. You see the arches. This is where they were widening the highway there. They go over like this here on those set of lanes there that they're building. But that's not that's not all. Let me let me just show let me show you a little bit different ones here. Let me close that one out. I'll give it to you from a different angle here. This is this is something that's that's very important in my opinion here. You can see here. This is on the other side, on the, uh, on the eastern side there. The arches again. You can't see the second one over there, but you can see where, the, where, the, where they're making the attachment to where it's going to be going over the other two lanes, already being constructed. And right here at the base of this, where I'm circling on the screen for you guys there, that wiring harness is also over on the other center column sections there, where no doubt guard booths are going to sit. Shimon Perez said back when he was making the deal in 1993 and 1994 with the Vatican then that they would internationalize Jerusalem, put a United Nations force there to protect it and to give the Palestinians a state. Rome is to help them get the Third Temple. One of the things that supposed to be done. In fact, they were hoping to have the third temple built there on the Temple Mount, but the deal fell through. Because why? Then Yasser Arafat refused. He would not sign the deal. They were willing to do the two-state agreement. Everything was set up and in line, and Yasser Arafat refused to allow it to have a third temple setting beside the Dome of the Rock. They weren't looking to replace the, rock, the Dome of the Rock either. They were looking at building it beside it, but he refused. But as you see, here, the checkpoint has already been built. There's checkpoints all over the place. But when it comes to Israelis living in Israel, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, it's always been open territory. Now, the world calls this occupied territory. It is not occupied territory. It belongs to Israel. God has prophesied it in his word, and the Jewish people are there as God had promised they would. And what's funny, though, is they call this occupied territory, and in fact, what makes that ludicrous is the mere fact that in the, prop, in the, in the Word of God, God has already stated, excuse me, not the Word of God, but, but in this case here, we already know the Word of God says it's for Israel, but in the British mandate, the British mandate was given all of this area to the Jewish people as a home. There's nothing mentioned in there about Palestinians. In fact, they were calling it the land of Palestine, but it was for the Jews. A, a Jewish birthplace, a place for, their, for, them, for the Jewish people to go. But they reneged on their promise, one after another, after another, after another, and slowly but surely the land got smaller, 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 and smaller. The only reason Israel's been able to get anything is because they did as it was in biblical times where God tells Israel, I have given you this land, and they went in there and they took the land. That's the way that they were able to possess it. So, biblical prophecies being fulfilled. Rome 
is helping the infrastructure here in order to take this land from the Jewish people. And this is the part that I want my Jewish brothers and sisters to see that. This is the, this is the deal that Shimon Perez made. Shimon Perez, by the way, is nothing more than the son of Ahab. Remember, the prophet Elijah was commanded of God to go back and tell Elijah that God would not bring the evils upon him because he saw the sincerity and repentance of his heart of the evils he had done. But he said he would bring it upon his son. Shimon Peres is that son. That is the prophecies that you're going to see fulfilled here. Now, again, going back to what the prophecy says here, be in pain and labor to bring forth the daughter of Zion like a woman in travail. For now thou shalt go forth out of the city and shall dwell in the field and shall come even to Babylon. There shalt thou be rescued. There shall the Lord redeem thee from the hand of, the, of thine enemies. And now many nations are assembled against thee that say, let her be defiled and let our eyes gaze upon Zion. Exactly what they're doing. Notice the part about gaze upon Zion, as we're going to go next to Obadiah, because they do gaze upon Zion, but, but they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel, for he hath gathered them as the sheaves of the threshing floor, as to the nations, because he's going to enter into judgment with the nations for the evils they've done to the Jewish people. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many peoples, and thou shalt devote their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. See, now shalt thou go, thou gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. They have laid siege against us. They smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. So it's going to be hard for Israel at first. This is Psalm 83, by the way. This is where God, they ask God, Be not thou silent, O God. Thy enemies, they have made a tumult against thee. You know, so it's a very serious time there. Now, again, I mentioned to you the prophecies that are being fulfilled. Let's go back and look at another one here. Uh, this, is, this is the famous one that, that so many people um, speak about, and that's Psalm 83. If I can only make this to work, let's see if we can get it here. Here we go. We're going now to Psalm 83. Um, and again, rabbinical brethren, my precious Jewish sisters that, are, that, that may watch this, the song, Psalm 83, many people call it this, the, the Psalm 83 war. But I find it kind of interesting because, yes, there's a war that is coming against Israel, but it's more of a confederacy, not so much a war. The war hadn't started as of yet, but they're crying out to God. The Jewish people are crying out to God, asking God not to be silent in this particular uh, endeavor there. And so we see as we begin to look at this psalm here, let me just bring that up for you so you can see that on uh, live stream, that is. Oh God, keep thou not silence. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies are in an uproar, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. That's their leader there. As we can see that, Nashau uh, Rosh, you know, they've lifted up their head. Uh, they, they hold crafty counsel against thy people, and take counsel against thy treasured ones, or actually in this case here, in Hebrew, al Sofonecha, which is hidden ones. Uh, so they've done that there. And it says the tents of, uh, excuse me, uh, back up, I got a little bit carried away here. Verse 5, they have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation. The name of Israel may be no more in remembrance, for they have consulted together with one consent against thee to uh, thee do they make a covenant. Uh, against thee do they make a covenant. They're making a covenant against God. And what, what kind of covenant would that be? That covenant is there that they're trying to take the land from the Jewish people. That's the covenant. That's what they, you, if, you, if you look at it, Psalm 83 reveals what the covenant is about. The covenant is to take the land from the Jewish people. And that's what this covenant is all about in the first place. Um, he says, For they have consulted together with one consent against thee, do, do they make a covenant? The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, see, Actually, in, uh, uh, in the King James Bible, it says the tabernacles of Edom. Now, according to Obadiah's prophecy, my Jewish brethren, Obadiah clearly de de defines that Esau's descendants are the ones that are called uh, 
are, are, are the Romans. We find this out, we'll, we'll go to that in just a second here, but we find this out here, that the tents are the tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarines, Gebal and Ammon and Amalek, Relishti with the inhabitants of Tyre and Syria also are joined with them. They have been an arm to the children of Lot, Silat. Uh, so then Israel is going to ask for God to intervene. But the whole point here is, is it's the, the tents here represent the churches that side with Rome. That is the tents, the churches that are siding with Rome. And then they join with the Muslim people coming against Israel to do what? To take the land. The covenant is to take Israel's land. The two-state solution, internationalizing the city of Jerusalem. Everything that is against what God said. God brought Israel home to dwell at Mount Zion. And yet, what is the Vatican doing? They're trying to take Mount Zion from the people. And this is something that God is not going to sit lightly for. Now, uh, quickly now, let's move over to Obadiah. And then we'll have one more verse we're going to look at, which we'll speak to, to my rabbinical brethren here in just a moment on this. But let's turn to Obadiah. In Obadiah, this is a one chapter book. We find out if you first begin at around verse six, uh, it says here, how is Esau searched out? How are his hidden places sought out? See, God's, in other words, God is going to reveal to you who Esau really is. Because remember, Esau hated Jacob. Even when they were in the womb of their mother's belly. And by the way, that is another prophecy, my rabbinical brethren, that was fulfilled. Rebecca's own vision that God gives her concerning the children that are in her womb, when she goes before God and says, why am I thus? And the Lord says to her, because there's two nations in thee or two manners of people, and when they come out, they will be two nations. Okay, they were two manners of people, and they were struggling in the womb. When they come out, God said it will be two nations. And that's exactly what is happening. There has been a struggle in the womb. Now, the Vatican is the one in behind all of this. It is the Vatican doing it, but the Vatican is doing what? Dividing the land of Israel to fulfill Joel's prophecy that they would divide the land of Israel. All right, but we must be a voice against that. So, and that was in that nine months, and I call that the nine-month negotiation where Rome was in there trying to separate uh, a Palestinian state and a Jewish state. And of course, Rome is doing it for their own benefit, as we see in Ezekiel chapter 35, um, something that we may not have time to go to, but if you look at that, you'll see that. But here, he says here that uh, all the men of, the, of, thy, of thy confederacy have, con have conducted thee to the border. The men of, that were at peace with thee have beguiled thee and prevailed against thee that they have eat thy bread, lay a snare unto thee, and in whom there is no discernment. See, there's a confederacy again, just like we see in Psalm 83. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and the discern, discernment out of the mount of Esau? And thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one that may be cut off from the mount of Esau may, uh, by slaughter. For the violence done to thy brother Jacob's shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Okay, so now God is going to, he's accusing Esau of violence against his brother Jacob. Well, let's, see, let's see when this is fulfilled. And then he says here, verse 11, In that day thou didst stand aloof, in the day the strangers carried away his substance, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was one of them. Wow, now God identifies the place. It's Jerusalem where this happens at. And so something happens to Israel where Esau is there watching the, the, the children of Israel be taken away captive. Well, this only happened a couple of times in, the, in Israel's history, so let's see when. But thou shouldst not have gazed upon the day of thy brother in the day of his disaster, neither shouldst thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. The children of Judah. The house of Judah, 70 CE. Now we know who it is. Jerusalem, the house of Judah, 70 CE, when Israel was carried into captivity. By who? Titus, the Roman general. And of course, historians, archaeologists say that Titus was not directly in the battle nor his men, but he had used the Syrian army in order to do this. Well, it's no surprise. Hadad, who was the sole surviving heir of Esau, who was raised in the courts of Pharaoh, later requests to go to his own country, goes to Syria, becomes the king of Syria. And then, of course, Obadiah finally records him in the land. 
of Rome. As Titus, the Roman general, standing aloof, as it were, but complicit in the destruction of the temple, in the destruction of the Jewish people, and the Jewish city. And just as Rome destroyed it 2,000 years ago, because why? Our people did not accept Yeshua to be the Mashiach. And he knew that that would happen. That's why he only read half of verse Isaiah 61 or read Isaiah 61, verse 1, and half of verse 2. Judgment is coming. But he did bring the acceptable year and set the captives free. And by the way, those captives that he set free were the animals. Remember when he went through there with the court and he beat the money changers out of the temple? And the Christian Bible records that he loosed the animals. They were the captives that were being set free. And also, we were captives as, as well. We were captives to the law, not to the promise. Women were captives because they were being held down, bound to traditions of Pharisees. But another scripture also brings that to light when Yeshua says in another place, if you knew what this meant, I did that desired mercy not sacrifice. He said, you would have not have condemned the guiltless. A lot of people think that that was Yeshua himself, and perhaps in a compound way it is. But I decided recently to take a look at this from the book of Matthew, the oldest script we have. It's in the Greek as well as it is in the Hebrew translation of Matthew's Gospel, has been preserved for over a thousand years. And in the Hebrew version, he said you would have not have bound the innocent. It's in the masculine plural. It's not in a singular. It lets us know that when he loosed the animals in the temple, that was the captives that were being set free. Binding them, it was clearly showing in the Hebrew gospel, he come to set the sacrificial system to stop it. It was not what God's intention was. As we see in many other prophecies. Because why? Yeshua was the Lamb of God. He had to put a stop to the sacrificial system because he was the lamb that was coming to free them, to free us as well. Free us from the laws of sin, to free us from bondage, and to free the animals as well. And that's probably a shock for many, especially even for my brothers and sisters here on live stream that are watching this live as I'm speaking about this even now. But that is certainly something that he came to do. Now, let's continue on as we read this here. Um, going down, he says here, verse 13, Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. We just read this here. Go on to verse 14. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut, to, 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 to cut off those who escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those that, had, had, that did remain in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all nations, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy dealing shall return upon thine own head. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all nations drink continually. Mm. That's serious. You that shall drink and swallow down, and shall be as though they have not been. My Jewish brethren, in the Hebrew language, it says, Kika asha shetetem al kodeshi. See, in the masculine plural. When Pope Francis, on his Easter Sunday Mass service, as it's called by the Catholic people, in 2014, his delegation, along with the priests there in Jerusalem, held a communion service on Mount Zion where they drank wine. It was men only in attendance at the first time. The following week they did it again 
And of course, there again, many more times, including throwing all the Jewish people out of the tomb of David and did it inside the tomb of David as well. My brothers and my sisters, biblical prophecy was being fulfilled by Pope Francis, but it was not in a good light. Because it says here, going back to that verse there, verse 16, For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, you, you all, we might say in Alabama, as you all have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and swallow down and shall be as though they had not been. And interesting how he says the nations, the goim. The Christian people are made up of all nations, but this is not real Christians. This is those that call themselves Christians, but they are not. You have a name, but it's not my name, as it says in the book of Revelation. See, they're not really Christians. They're only Catholic. Not to say there couldn't be some good Catholic people that love the Lord. But this is totally different. And so he identifies the first communion service of the first drinking of the wine. You or they there that are going to drink here is going to be masculine plural. It'll be more than one man drinking. But it will only be men. The second time, it's gender inclusive. Both men and women will be a part of it. And they'll continue to do it from that point on until God brings judgment. Because he does bring judgment. Because he says, And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them, and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken. God is going to bring judgment upon Rome. Without a doubt, Rome is going to be judged for this evil that they're doing to the children of Israel. Now, in closing here, as I said too, by the way, you can go to Ezekiel. You'll see clearly there in Ezekiel chapter 35, it says these two nations. Esau sets his sight on these two nations. Why does he speak about two nations? Because the land of Israel is divided between the Palestinians and the Jewish people. And Rome is the one that is saying, because these two nations shall be mine. So God looks upon that, and God is going to divide Rome. A little different than what we think. It's going to be his Roman Empire, the Babylonian Empire. That may very well include the United States under judgment, because that's the Roman soldiers. And NATO, of course, and their allies. So anyway, let's move on to another particular verse here. And this, this in closing here, is going to be for my rabbinical brethren. It's the last book of Isaiah that we have known to us today. The book of Isaiah 66. Let me take you there. Those of you watching the live stream, you'll be able to follow along. It says, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you may build unto me, and where is the place may be my resting place. Isn't it interesting? God is asking the question here in Isaiah 66, a very much a prophetic chapter of a future event. God is asking Israel, Thus saith the Lord, Ka o man, Hashem, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you may build unto me? God knows, Rabbi Richmond, he knows your notable desire to want to build a third temple for God. But also I know the Vatican has a heavy hand in behind this as well. And they may say this is for all nations. You're, the, the, the Vatican is trying to bring a millennial reign without the Mashiach. Is this why one of the rabbis are announcing the Mashiach will reveal himself in September? Mashiach cannot reveal himself, brethren, until Eliyahu comes and fulfills Malachi. And for the Christians, it's in chapter 4. It's the last part of chapter 3 for my Jewish brethren. It's got to be fulfilled first. He's got to forerun Mashiach. For the Christian, we know that Yochanan, John, did forerun the Mashiach. And he did come in the spirit of Elijah. But it does say, by the very same, Yeshua says, when they ask him the question, the scribes say that Elijah must first come. 
Yeshua says, now John's dead already. He says, truly Elijah shall first come and restore all things. So a restoration of the word has got to come. And even my Jewish brethren, you know, Rashi, the great Torah commentator, taught that when Moses sung the song in, in Psalm 50, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 15, Asherah Ladonai Gaol Ga'ah, I will sing unto the Lord, that it was in a future tense. That he's gotten victory over the horse and over his rider. And he's hurled them into the sea. One horse, one rider. That's your Antichrist spirit that the Christian church speaks so much of. Must be coming a horse rider. Moses must return. In Christian teaching, in the book of Revelation chapter 11, teaches that there's going to be a temple to be built. And when the temple begins to be built, that God will send two witnesses to bring judgment. It's not that they're against the building of the third temple. But let me show you what they will be against because it's written in Isaiah 66. Now, I know you cite Numbers chapter 19, the red heifer. And the law that is stated to be of Moses that was given for the red heifer. But you see, we have passed the time of the sacrificial service. And now God declares to the prophet Yeshayahu, Isaiah, here in, um, in this chapter here, he says, what house will you build me? Verse 2, for all these things hath my hand made, and all of these things came to be, saith the Lord. But on this man will I look, even on him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. So the thing is, is God is not coming for those that are all excited about building the temple, but he's coming for the one that has got that contrite spirit and of a simple heart, the one that is willing to repent at his coming, the one that is willing to look at Zechariah 12, and they look upon the one that was thrust through. And they look at him and they say, they weep and mourn as a family would for their only son that was lost. The way we see Israel when they weep and mourn over a son that is killed by a suicide bomber or a, a, a murdering terrorist. They will weep and mourn like this. When they look at the one that was rejected 2,000 years ago. As Zechariah promised. In fact, Zechariah shows that it's the house of Judah that sees this. The, house, the, the family of David, the family of Nathan, which is the tribe of Judah. The family of Levi, the Levites. The family of Benjamin excuse me, uh, Shimei, which is a Benjamite, and the families that remain, which are the Samaritans. Everything was being set up exactly the way it was 2,000 years ago. Rome is in control. They have gained control over Jerusalem. Why? We've allowed it. The infrastructure proves you've allowed Rome to take control. They're internationalizing Jerusalem as we speak. So he sends in his two witnesses, and this is what they're going to preach as well. Back to Isaiah 66, verse 3. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. So the red heifer, Rabbi Richmond, is not what God is interested in. He said, he that sacrificeth a lamb as if he broke a dog's neck. He that offereth a meal offering as if he offered swine's blood. God have mercy. And... Even my wife and I, last year, during the barley harvest with Gershon and Solomon, we marched through the streets with the barley harvest in our hands. He doesn't even want that. I've even repented before the Lord. But we didn't offer it. We weren't able to offer it. But he says if you offer that, it's as if you offered up swine's blood. And then he goes on to say here, He that maketh memorial offering of frankincense as if he blessed an idol. That's when you burn incense. Just like the Catholic Church does all through the old city and their different altars to Baal. He doesn't want the incense. He doesn't want the sacrifices. He does not want a red heifer. He does not want a lamb offered up. He wants a broken heart. He wants the ones that are in Zechariah 12 that are weeping and mourning and say, where did you get this wound? And he'll answer back in the house of my friends. This is what he's coming to look for. And so God continues on to say, Even so, I will, I will choose 
their mockings, and I will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, none did answer. When I spoke, they did not hear. But they did that which was evil in mine eyes, and chose that in which I delighted not. My rabbinical brethren, that is the prophecy. That was speaking of when Christ was here 2,000 years ago. He said to you then, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Think about it, will you? Pray about it, and I'll be praying for you as well, because I know the hour is not. It's time for the Mashiach to come on the scene. And he will reveal himself. Let's be ready with that broken spirit, that contrite heart. Let's be ready for this.